it, it's this, um, uh, you know, my, my, my next question um, should be about philosophy, because um, in a video of yours, of your um, five minutes therapy tips that are great, and I suggest for every psychologist and psychotherapist to uh, see those videos, you talk about philosophy. And um, it's something about um, what you just just said in this moment, because um, I think that philosophy, um, the idea of change behind the therapist's action is one of the most important things for effective and brief change, you know? Yes. Um, so this is the, um, the right philosophy for Jeffrey Zayed to approach therapy, it is this. Yes. You know, so first of all, psychotherapy developed from philosophy. And uh, really, <clears throat> the ideas of philosophers eventually evolved into uh, ideas that could be researched in psychology, mm-hmm. and eventually <clears throat> ideas that were used by Freud to invent psychotherapy in 1885, when Freud first became interested in the psychological aspects of, the me- of medicine. You know, my philosophy, as I uh, develop, I've been doing therapy for 45 years as a counselor, uh, and before that as a, as a paraprofessional, but as a, as a licensed professional for 45 years. And my philosophy is an exaggeration. My belief is, is that the state of the therapist is the progenitor of the technique. So most students learn techniques, Mm -hmm. like, you know, Giorgio Nardoni is a good friend and he's a brilliant tactician and uh, he could give you a technique for working with an obsessive compulsive patient and it would work. But my philosophy is that the state of the therapist is the progenitor of the technique. You can start therapy from the perspective of theory, of research, of technique. Mm But I uh, uh, take a very radical perspective and I say the state of the therapist is the most important. Erickson contributed more than 300 cases to the literature and we still find new ones. Now, Erickson did this because he was in a utilization state and that was one of the states that Erickson occupied. And utilization is a state of response readiness, ready to respond constructively to what's ever offered and whatever exists in the context. And all of Erickson's 300 cases are based in utilization. Now we could say that Erickson was a tactician and that he was thinking strategically about all of the moves that he was making. And some of that is true. He was in a strategic state and not necessarily thinking about all of the steps, but he was in a state of being strategic. He was in the state of being evocative. He was in the state of um, uh, being multiple level in his communication, and recognizing that the informative and the evocative levels of communication could both be utilized effectively to promote change. So what I, when I write about Erickson, I write about the states that he inhabited and that the technique that he used evolved from the state. So a friend of mine in the 1970s was visiting uh, Erickson, and uh, he had a case of a couple, and the wife had scoliosis. She had a curved spine. Mm -hmm. And the therapist and the wife thought that the husband's sexual avoidance was due to scoliosis. The husband said no. And uh, the therapist still believed that the scoliosis uh, was a, an important factor in the husband's sexual avoidance and asked Erickson for a consultation. And Erickson said, well, I would take the woman aside. I would take the men, men aside. I would talk to them. I would give them a new orientation. I would say to them, men love curves. Men are designed to love curves. Men are enculturated to love curves. And I would begin to give him a new orientation. Now, you can't come to a sentence like that so quickly unless you're in a utilization state, ready to utilize whatever you're given constructively. And Erickson called in himself a utilization state. 
And I've known this for 45 years and I'm still working on it. That there's no problems, there are only challenges to utilize. And once you can get into that state, then being strategic, being multiple level, being experiential, all of these things amalgamate together into a robust form of being a therapist. It's funny because you um, you are anticipating my questions because I um, mm -hmm. I would like to um, to ask you a, a suggestion. You know there is um, this book uh, Experience um, Ericsson. This is the Italian uh, translator. He has a very good book, still a very good book, um, in, in which there is uh, what I call the observing task that Ericsson suggest to you to improve your skill. Sure. It's very interesting and I suggest to every psychologist to read this book and other books about Newton Erickson. And um, I, honestly, I do it very often since I read this book and it seems to me that fits with the deliberate practice uh, that is a, an idea that is spreading around since a while. So um, I would like to ask you um, uh, to suggest to the therapist uh, um, some some idea um, to improve uh, as professional. Probably uh, an idea could be how to be in, in that kind of state. Of course, yeah. In Erickson was in an acuity state. It was one of the states that he inhabited. It was as if he would just turn on his gaze. And when I visited Erickson, I was a more internally preoccupied person. And I could have been a Jungian therapist because I was interested. I wasn't, I, I didn't learn, I didn't come from a lineage of people, my father, my grandfather, who were especially observant. Mm -hmm. So Erickson recognized a weakness in me and he gave me tasks that would help me to develop an inferior function. Yeah. He would say, go to a schoolyard, watch children predict which child will speak first, which child will play with what toy, which child will leave the group first. And he would give me challenges. Um, you're, a man is walking towards you, he's wearing street clothes, he's a policeman, how do you know? Now Erickson was a massively visually perceptive person, but if you spent a year being paralyzed, you would probably, which he did when he was 17, 18 and recovering from polio, you would be uh, more visually as perceptive too. He ha didn't have anything else to do other than be perceptive, yeah. auditorily and, and visually. It's not that this is a necessity. You know, people like Steve DeShazer and Albert Ellis weren't especially visually perceptive and they were brilliant therapists. People like Fritz Perls were extraordinarily visually perceptive, and that was a mainstay of their therapy. But um, I have a book coming out very soon by Franco Angeli, which is my book on hypnotic induction, which will be in Italian. Okay. And for those of you who read English, there's another book that I wrote called Psychoaerobics. It's about therapist development. Yeah. And the largest category of experiential exercises is about acuity, because acuity could be divided into a dozen different components. You know, there's acuity to detail, there's acuity to pattern, there's acuity to things that are conspicuously absent. There is a, 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 a acuity to uh, interactional effects. There's not one uh, observational skill. So just like I would divide depression into a series of components, I would divide acuity into components. Mm -hmm. And I will, in the, this book, Psychoaerobics, which is available from ericsson-foundation.org, mm -hmm. in that book, I have a series of exercises that address all of the different components of being perceptive, mm -hmm. um, visual concentration, visual attention, visual detail, And you can't just uh, say observe and stay with that as a concept, observe how, what, when, 
and um, Erickson's observational skills were remarkable. And he, what he did was he often practiced inference, which was another skill set of, of, of acuity. When, X, then, Y. Yeah. So uh, a woman who I saw who had been a patient of Erickson's became a patient of mine. And I said to him, in, to her, what was the experience with Erickson? And she said, well, in the first session, Erickson said to me, you are not your mother's favorite, but you were your grandmother's favorite, probably your maternal grandmother. And he was right. And that, that was unforgettable to her uh, uh, two decades after she saw Erickson. She still remembered that moment. Now, it's possible that Erickson's inferences were wrong some of the time, yeah. but they wouldn't have been remembered. So one of the skill sets that I don't have is inference. So um, I would go into a restaurant I would hear the waitress in the United States say something, and I would say, you were born in the south of the United States, probably Georgia. And I would try to make an inference based on a slight accent that I heard. And uh, I you know, would say to somebody uh, in, a, in a grocery store, you're not uh, an oldest child, you were probably yo a youngest child. And this is deliberate practice in an unrelated field where I'm practicing inference because this was a skill set that Erickson was very strong at, that I'm weak at. And so if I keep on exercising those muscles, then I could uh, develop a more in my procedural memory. Uh, a more rapid way of making inference. So uh, people would need to decide what fragment of observe is it necessary for them to develop? What are they good at? Where are there are weaknesses? Like some people have strong biceps, but weak triceps, then you exercise your triceps more. So you, you, you uh, have to make uh, a, um, a, a careful study of the components of observation. And yes, Erickson, you know, was, you know, amazing at observation. I interviewed one of his son-in-laws. They were driving through the street and uh, Erickson said, drive around the block. So they drove around the block. And Erickson said, that woman standing there is a man. Yeah. Now, he, he uh, recognized something that he saw the first time about the way in which that person was moving. And uh, so it's, it's almost, and, and Erickson would say, quite frankly, that he loved to go to the airport early and Mrs. Erickson didn't. So he would go to the airport early just to watch people. Yeah. And, uh, and he was consistently observing. And um, that made him an outsider because Erickson wasn't the kind of person that you could talk with about politics. He was consistently evocative and consistently conceptual and fascinated with what he could learn and loved to observe and um, understand what it was that he was observing. You know, if he saw this, the person might have had this history. If he saw this, the person might have this future. And he said that he took, when he was in graduate school, he really didn't have training in psychiatry from many experts. He had to invent himself as a psychiatrist. It was the end of World War One. There wasn't many psychiatrists when he was in medical school. So um, Erickson um, uh, would get a social history from the social work service and he would write out a mental status examination then he would do the real mental status examination and compare it with his intuitive mental status examination then he would do the opposite he would take a mental status examination and write social history and then he would compare that to the real social 
Now, Eric several. Erickson really wanted to be the world's great psychotherapeutic communicator, and in my estimation, he accomplished that. But he worked diligently, and he worked slavishly in the same way that a, a great um, soccer player, a great tennis player would have to practice religiously to be at the very top of the game. And Erickson was always practicing. If you, uh, and I never did go out to dinner with him, but if you would have gone out to dinner with him, he would have been practicing. Could he get you to turn the salt shaker around 360 degrees without you realizing what that that he, you were responding to one of his suggestions, and then he would delight in the way that you would learn something about implicit responsiveness. Okay. So he was always on, and uh, uh, I you know don't like to I, can't, I don't have that concentration. I can't uh, concentrate that intently for that long a period of time. There was a story about Erickson being at a social reception with Margaret Mead. And this, they had a receiving line. So the hostess was greeting all of the guests who lined up to greet her. And Erickson, and Margaret Mead was behind Erickson, and Erickson smiles. He's very warm in his tone of voice. He's looking at her intently, and he's shaking her hand. And he says, you know, those horses' tails that we had for hors d'oeuvres were absolutely wonderful. I hope that I can get the recipe. And she says, thank you very much, and walks off. Now, of course, nobody serves horses' tails. And Erickson wanted to demonstrate to Margaret Mead that the content of the communication is not necessarily important, that the way in which you offer the communication uh, may be most important. And if you follow the rules of society that uh, were um, in that particular situation, the person might not even hear the content, which the hostess didn't. And Erickson was experimenting and he was uh, trying to demonstrate something and learn something about human behavior. So he was consistently establishing experiments for himself and he loved it. And I, um, I don't have that mentality. I'm glad he did, but it's not my style. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Reading your books, I think that you have a great mentality. You, you can teach us a, a lot of things, but I, I know what you mean. 